service by your local cable television operator. Database Nation is a new book by technology writer Simpson Garfinkel. In this book, Mr. Garfinkel asserts that increasing technology is responsible for decreasing consumer privacy. Mr. Garfinkel spoke recently at the Cambridge Forum in Cambridge, Massachusetts. His remarks were about an hour and 15 minutes. Welcome to Cambridge Forum discussing Database Nation, the death of privacy in the 21st century. I'm Pat Zerke, director of the forum. Cambridge Forum is in its fourth decade of bringing you live public programs for the discussion of the issues and ideas that are shaping our world. Leading our discussion is Simpson Garfinkel, journalist, author, and recognized expert in the field of computer security. Educated at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and Columbia University School of Journalism, he has designed innovative and successfully marketed computer and internet applications for a wide range of uses, from medical imaging to accounting. In 1998, he founded his third startup enterprise, Sandstorm Enterprises, to commercialize the computer hacker's war dialer. He remains president of Vineyard.net, a company he founded to provide internet service to Martha's Vineyard. Garfinkel also writes widely about technology. He is a columnist for the Boston Globe and a regular contributor to Wired Magazine and Technology Review. His articles have appeared in more than 30 publications nationally and internationally. He has authored, edited, or co-authored nine books, including PGP, Pretty Good Privacy, in 1995, and Web Security and Commerce in 1997. Garfinkel's most recent book, Database Nation, The Death of Privacy in the 21st Century, serves as the basis for our discussion of the unique threats that computer technology poses to personal privacy and the steps that individuals can take to guard their personal information, activities, and their very identities. Welcome to Cambridge Forum, Simpson Garfinkel. Thanks so much. So I brought some AV aids, which don't translate well to radio. We'll try to get around that. One of the things that I've been noticing is that over the past six months or so, there's been a real explosion of interest in things having to do with privacy. And it seems that the main thing that's causing that explosion is the internet. Lots and lots of people have gotten online and people are realizing that the internet is a place which lends itself to invasions of privacy. And surveys have said that uh, there are millions of people who refuse to buy things on the internet because they're afraid of providing their credit card. And uh, as a person who's been using the internet since 1983, uh, you can imagine that I get more unwanted junk mail or spam mail than uh, most other people do. My email address has been around for a long time. Uh, recently, there was a lot of concern about websites that had been constructed for the purpose of marketing to children. And in fact, the United States Congress passed a law called the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, which goes into full force later on this year. But the point that, that I've been trying to make in the book is that the internet is not the problem. The attacks on privacy have been going on for a very long time. And if anything, the, the internet is simply a reflection of the future that we're moving towards. So I, uh, I published the book Database Nation in January. And originally, I had wanted to have this book published in 1989. I spent about 10 years trying to get this book out. And while I was on the book tour, people kept coming up to me with more things that I should have put in the book, or more announcements, uh, more attacks on privacy. And one of the most interesting ones happened uh, the first day of my book tour. A um, newspaper article in the New York Post 
talked about the New York City Metro cards. And it turns out that, that these cards you can purchase with cash or you can purchase over the internet with a credit card. And they allow you to ride on the New York City subway. But one thing that they were doing that nobody was aware of is that they were also recording the movements of everybody who used the cards on the New York City subway. Now you might wonder, how do these cards do that? Well, it turns out that every card has a serial number. And it turns out that in order to build a system that was resistant to fraud, the New York City, uh, the MTA, the Metropolitan Transit Authority, set up a large database system that would record for every card use, the serial number of the card, the station where it was used, the time where it was used, and the amount of money left on the card. Now, <clears throat> most people didn't know that this system had been created. There was no public discussion as to whether or not the MTA should be building a large surveillance system. They just built a large surveillance system. And when the police found out about this surveillance system, they immediately realized that they could use this in law enforcement. In the New York Post article, there were several examples of how police had arrested a person, seized their card, and gotten a list of the locations where that person had been. In one case, uh, it was used to disprove an alibi. A person said that they had not been near a particular subway station where a heinous crime was committed. And in fact, they had gone into the subway station about 10 minutes after the murder. So they said, see, this, this proves your alibi. In another case, a person who was uh, accused of committing a crime in, in Manhattan claimed that they hadn't left Staten Island on that day, but their Metro card had been used in Manhattan on that day. <clears throat> now, you might think, well, what's the problem here? Isn't it a good idea that the police have this new tool for fighting crime? And it probably is a good idea that the police have a new tool for fighting crime, because criminals certainly have new tools all the time. Unfortunately, this isn't a tool that was designed for the purpose of fighting crime. This was a tool that was designed for allowing people to ride the subway. And it's not necessarily the best system. The first thing is, we don't know what provisions the MTA has made for protecting the database. We don't know if it's possible to put false information into the database, or if it's possible to remove information on a case-by-case -case basis. It's not clear who gets access to the database, if the police can get access with a warrant, or if they just need to have a friend over at the MTA. It's not clear if MTA employees are allowed to use the system to sort of check on the movements of their friends or their like ex-girlfriends and ex-boyfriends. <clears throat> None of this is really clear. And it turns out that even if they had policies, it wouldn't really matter very much because we don't have any laws in this country that cover these sorts of databases. Now, there's another system that I, I actually wrote about in the book. And this is the Easy Pass system. Is everybody familiar with Easy Pass? It, it's throughout Massachusetts and New York. It's moving into New Jersey. It allows you to pay tolls electronically. You can simply have this little tag in your car. And when you drive through the toll plaza, it records your ID and it records the time and the place. And you, that amount of the toll is debited from an account. And at the end of each month, they send you a paper letter with the toll crossings that you've done. Now, this is another surveillance system. And there have already been court cases in which the police have asked for access to Easy Pass. And in one case in New York City, the court ruled that the police didn't need to have a, a search order or a warrant for that information, that all they had to do was ask. Because positional information is not information that's traditionally protected under the Constitution. The police could simply sit by the turnpike and write down people's driver's license or write down people's uh, license plate numbers as the cars went by. And that this was basically the same idea. Now, I've heard, I haven't had it confirmed, that there are easy pass readers around New York City that are not being used for toll collection. Now, the interesting thing about the Easy Pass system is that there's no way to know if that's true or not, because the tags don't light up when they're read. The way the system was designed, it's completely passive from the point of view of the driver. You simply have to trust that the tag, that the tag readers are where they say they are. And there's no real way to turn off your tag 
other than by like putting it in the glove compartment or trying to shield it, but you really have a hard time knowing if it's properly shielded or not. There's no switch to turn it off. That's the way the system was designed. Now, this is a question of design. When I was writing the book back in 1995 when I was working on this book, uh, Massachusetts was thinking about which automatic toll collection system to deploy. And there were actually two systems that Massachusetts could have chosen. One of them was the Easy Pass system, and another one was an anonymous system in which every, your money was kept on a smart card that you'd leave in the reader. You could take it out, and then you could, your smart card wouldn't be there. And it turns out that the RFP, the Request for Proposals, that the Massachusetts Turnpike Authority put out specifically disallowed the anonymous system. The only systems that they would accept were account-based systems. I, I interviewed the person who made the RFP, and I said, why are you doing this? And they said, well, we don't really think there's a privacy issue. Uh, we think that it's just the same as credit cards. Well, it's, it's not the same as credit cards. I think what was happening was that they simply didn't understand the privacy issues, and there was no organization in the government charged with enforcing privacy issues. So. We, we clearly are building a world with pervasive surveillance. And what I say in the book, Database Nation, is that it's too late to turn that clock back. We've made a decision as a society to build pervasive tracking systems. We're building a surveillance society. But it's not too late to control what's done with that data. Now, there are technical reasons why it's much easier to build a society in which everything is recorded. And there are also some sociological reasons. One of them is that as human beings, we hate the idea of throwing information away. Because, you know, you might need it some time later. But at the same time, while we're building these large data banks, we haven't put in place much in the way of protection of saying what the people who are collecting the data, what obligations they have for the data that they are collecting. Now, back in 1973, the Nixon administration looked at this issue in detail. And they came up with something called the Code of Fair Information Practices. The Code of Fair Information Practices is sort of a, a rules to live by for people in the information age. And we put them into law for credit reporting but we didn't really put them into law for much else. And I'm, I'm going to go through them. The first one is that basically there should be no secret record keeping system. If you're going to have a system that collects personal information on a massive scale, you should make that fact known. And in both of the cases that I described, the subway cards and the, the easy pass, Neither of those organizations have done a particularly good job making the fact that they're collecting this information widely known. The second is that if you have a record in that database, you should have a right to see your record. And for the most part, the, the EasyPass system gives you a statement once a month, but the other system, the subway system, it doesn't do it at all. People have no way of seeing their records to seeing if they're correct or not. The third one is that if, if the information in the database is wrong, there should be a way to correct it. The fourth is that um, there should be a way to take the, inf to, for the information that's collected, you should have a way to make sure that it is used only for the purpose for which it is collected. Now, in both of these cases, you can imagine there are many other uses that the organizations can make the data useful for. They're, they're already using it for law enforcement. But they could use this information for marketing as well. Now, marketing sounds really scary, right? Um, the MTA could generate a list of every person using a particular exit that uses uh, EasyPass. And if that, that, that list would be very useful for a company putting up a store at a mall, uh, try, trying to get a list of everybody who's using the exits, uh, who they should send letters to. The last one is that if you are an organization that you're creating or maintaining these databases, it, you should take certain precautions to make sure that it's only accessed by legitimate people, that it's not misused, that it, the information in it is correct. You should have basically responsibilities as a data custodian. Now these are 
are very radical ideas in U.S. law, and I think it's really interesting that we came up with them under the Nixon administration. The question is, why didn't they make it into law? And the answer is, it came up during the Nixon administration, and the United States got distracted by this thing called Watergate. And then we got distracted by a whole bunch of other things throughout the 70s, and we lost the opportunity to get substantive legislation on privacy or data protection issues. That didn't happen in Europe. Europe took up the uh, idea of data protection. They created a large bureaucracy for dealing with these issues. Now, some European countries have done a good job, and some European countries have done a bad job, but at least they've done something. It's interesting. Most democracies in the industrialized world have created more rights for their citizens for data protection than the United States. Even Hong Kong has a data protection commissioner. So under communist China, they have more data protection rights than we do. Now, moving to the future, I basically see that, that we have a choice right now for the next two years or so. We have a choice to get substantive data protection legislation, or we could keep doing what we've been doing and just let the marketplace decide. And there's a third option in the future, which is propose, you know, proposed by people like David Brin, a science fiction novelist. He says, go for no privacy, that privacy is actually very corrosive to human society. And the sooner we get rid of privacy, the better. So I want to look at those. The market approach is the approach that we're doing right now. And it's largely an approach which says, if companies disclose what they are doing, and if government agencies disclose what they're doing, then hum you know, citizens will be able to make a rational decision about whether they want to participate in those, those events and those, those procedures. In fact, the, the Federal Trade Commission has been pushing really hard to require websites to have privacy policies. And the theory is if you go to a website and you read its privacy policy to see what they're doing with their personal information, then you can make an informed decision. Now, there are some logical problems with this approach that, as applied to the Internet. And the one is that when you're reading the privacy policy on the website, it's already too late. You're at the website but you haven't filled out any forms yet. Now, it's interesting that I actually printed out the EasyPass website, and I printed out the MetroCard website, and neither of these websites have privacy policies. And they might argue that they don't need a privacy policy because they're not collecting information on the internet. Well, they're not. They're collecting a lot of information. It's just not on the internet. And in fact, recent surveys of companies that have privacy policies find that, for the most part, they're not following their privacy policies. Many of them not on the internet, and the majority of them, they're not following it in the rest of their, their organization. But let's say for a moment that privacy policies actually work. Well, Looking down the line, I mean, right now there's a star market. It's a grocery store around here. They have these star cards that give you a discount. Sometimes it's a significant discount. In return for that discount, they collect your name and a list of everything that you bought, and they use that for market analysis. Well, they don't really have to use that card to get that information. Star Market could install video cameras at all the checkout counters. In fact, they may have, because video cameras now are about the size of a pencil eraser. And they could do face recognition and get your identity and compare that with everything in your shopping cart. In fact, there's this advertisement on television. A guy who walks through the store puts things in his pockets. And as he walks out, the guard stops him because he forgot his receipt. That's completely possible with today's technology. Nobody has built it yet, but it is possible. And if we're going to let the free market depend, defend our privacy, we might be in a situation in the future where the only way to defend our privacy is by wearing paper bags when we go about in public. Now, I don't think that's a very good solution. There's lots of other cases in which we can see that the market has done a lousy job. For instance, in the 1950s, in the early 1960s, the market did a lousy job protecting the environment. It wasn't in companies' interest to make 
environmentally friendly products because nobody understood what that meant and there was so much other damage being done to the environment that if a company was stupid enough to try to make an environmentally friendly product they'd be murdered in the marketplace because other, other people would have tremendous advantages. We're seeing the same problem on the internet and that is the companies that are violating their privacy policies or don't even have privacy policies are bad actors. They poison the well for everybody, but the companies that are spending all the money on marketing, they're saying, look at all the, the privacy protections we have. The, the, the bad privacy companies are getting a free ride. They have a lower cost of doing business because they don't have as many protections. So the market will favor companies that lie, that say they're protecting their, your privacy and trick you. They don't do it. Maybe they don't actually lie, but maybe they're just not doing a very, you know, you have to be a lawyer to understand their policies. The, um, the market also did a lousy job protecting drugs back in 1900, 1910. We saw lots and lots of patent drugs on the market. And it wasn't until we brought in federal regulation in the form of the Pure Food and Drug Act, and we set up a federal bureaucracy to enforce that act, that we actually started getting standards for, for pure food and drug. Now, I'd like to look at the, at the no privacy future because that's one that's actually very popular with people who are members of the privileged class. You know, if, if you are doing well, if you have a good job, if people treat you fairly, then you might wonder what's the fuss about? Uh, why, why have privacy protection? Wouldn't it be better if everybody just had everything known and then we could all be rational and nice about the whole thing? And one of the examples that, that people who propound the no privacy view give is medical records. They say, the problem with medical records is, isn't that they're private. The problem is that they're not public enough. Everybody's medical records should be posted on the internet. And then what we can do is we can, you know, everybody's susceptible to some disease. Everybody's had some problem. And we'll just all be very, you know, rational Englishmen about it. And we'll understand the problems and we'll, we'll deal. But the problem is that doesn't work in practice. And the reason it doesn't work in practice is because we're all different. Some people get sick. Some people don't get sick. Some people get sick but overcome their sicknesses through tremendous perseverance. And other people, they just don't care and they call in sick all the time. And the problem is if you take all of that information, it makes it very easy to discriminate against people. Uh, on the side, you, you cite this objective information. And the people who do have legitimate problems that they've overcome, they, they should have a right not to be constantly reminded of these problems they've overcome. But privacy serves many, many purposes in our society. Yet the, the no privacy argument says somehow we're going to, to overcome all of that. So in, in the closing minutes that I have, about two, I, I want to say what, my, what I'd like to see in the future, and that is I'd like to see the establishment of a federal data protection law. And I'd like to see the creation of a data protection commission to enforce that law. I think that commission could be a watchdog over federal agencies and over state agencies. It could be there as a resource to the Metropolitan Transit Authority and to the Massachusetts Psych Authority saying, stop what you're doing. You're not putting in privacy protections. It could be a resource to American businesses. And I also think that, that it could be a it can serve the function of raising the bar of the uh, privacy environment of the 21st century, just as the EPA brought about a, a much cleaner physical environment. Now, a lot of people say privacy is dead. It's, it's the subtitle of my book. But my hope is that privacy isn't dead, that we can protect what's left of privacy and actually increase our privacy in the 21st century. And we can do that if we try. It's solely up to us. You're joining us at Cambridge Forum, listening to Simpson Garfinkel discuss Data Bay Nation. I'd like to, to follow up on your chart. The death of privacy has been announced before, and I'm thinking particularly of Vance Packard's book from the 60s. Um, but the concept of privacy is still with us. Privacy did not die in the 60s. Um, is its current, are rumors of its current demise something those related to Mark Twain's, are they exaggerated? Or do you see as different about threats to privacy today? Well, 
I read Vance Packard's book. There, there were actually a whole bunch of books about that were published between 1965 and 1973. And those books created uh, many you know, hearings and special committees. There was a committee on, on the, the invasions of privacy caused by computers. And we're dealing with, with root invasions of privacy that would have shocked people in the 1960s. I, I flew down to Washington, D.C. yesterday, and I had people who make $8 an hour look at the insides of my luggage. And I had somebody pass a wand over my body to see if I had any metal. And that's, that's routine for us right now. I, I don't see ever a complete death of privacy. Because I think there will be a violent reaction on the part of the American people as more and more privacy rights are taken away. We're going to be in a future in which we have strong privacy legislation. The question is, how much dislocation in our society do we want to have first? I really don't think that we're going to hit 2050 or 2090 in the end of the 21st century without privacy legislation, if there is still a country here, if there's still a human race. The question is, you know, if we do it now, it's going to be cheaper than if we do it in 10 years. So you see the major threats to privacy today coming from what combination of the market, the technological capacities that we have, ignorance on the part of the general population, all of the above? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Back in the 60s, one of their main concerns was the federal government. And we actually passed a lot of legislation limiting what the federal government could do with personal information. Like, we passed something called the Privacy Act. And we also passed the, the FOIA, the Freedom of Information Act. And together, they have really helped the situation. I see the main threat of being business because uh, business is developing these advanced technologies. Business is using them largely without regulation. And business doesn't have long-term societal interests as its interests. Businesses are rightly concerned with increasing shareholder value and short maximizing short-term profits. Companies that don't do that go out of business. So what I see is we need to have legislation so that businesses are coerced into doing the right thing. Because if we don't, we're going to be, be increasing their short-term profits at the cost of everybody's public interest. I wonder if this is a question you are asked often. Are you asked if you're paranoid? No, I'm really not. Um, and, I didn't ask and if I don't you were that paranoid. Way. I'm asked if, you, if people react no, that way to your ideas. Pe people ask me what... I do to protect my own privacy. And they say, God, that you have a website with the, your wedding photos on it. Um, and I generally respond, I don't talk about what I do to protect my privacy. But I do talk about other things that I do, all things on the internet with my credit card. I buy a lot of things on the internet with my credit card. And I've actually had credit cards killed in the past year because of fraud. Uh, and it's really annoying. It happens right when you're going away on a business trip. And I, I think that it's probably because of internet merchants. But who knows? You know, there's a that's a name. Um, I wrote a book on using encrypted email, the GT book. But I hate it when people send me encrypted mail. And I was dealing with these people in California recently. They wanted to send me a contract, and they wanted to encrypt it so they would intercept it. And I said, no, just mail it to me. And then they said, well, could we fax it? I said, well, if you fax it to me, it's to five other people. It's going to be stored in an SQL database on the web. And it would really be easier if you just send it to me by email. And they finally did. And of course, nothing, nothing happened. I wish it wasn't hard to encrypt it, but it, it is. It's really important to understand what the threats are. Hey, those people who are not being specifically targeted, the main threats are businesses trying to gain a lot of information about them so that the businesses can sell them things more effectively. And I don't having my phone ring at night. Now, there's a large number of people, more than 300,000, who've had identity stolen, who've had to get their human social security or their credit cards and their names. And for these people, they, they go to a nightmare existence because all these bills are run up in their name. And, and they didn't do it. And the system is, is gimmicked against them. I actually got emailed yesterday by this one person who, whose loan was sold, except she didn't have a loan. So Fleet believes that she owes Fleet tens of thousands of dollars. And Fleet is now suing her for non-payment. And it's been a nightmare. And she says, that, you know, produce the document. And there is no document. She's going to court and as a defendant. So I, I'm not paranoid. I'm aware of the risks of living. And the, the problem is society is getting riskier and riskier for individuals. 
what can an individual do? You don't want to tell us what to do, but what are some of the things an individual can do given the wealth of information that can be collected and used without their knowledge on a, on a magnetic card? Well, I think need to do two things. And it's really simple. The first thing is, to protect yourself, you should be cagey with the personal information you give out. When people want personal information, you should ask them why. But the second thing is, you can let yours know that this is an issue that we want privacy legislation. The real big thing going on in Congress right now is that they're thinking of putting together a study commission to see if there should be privacy legislation. I think the time for study is over. We've been doing studies since 1960. Time is for action right now. And the only way we're going to get action is if people make this clear to their makers that this is an agenda issue. I, um, yeah. So. We're listening to Simpson Garfinkel at Cambridge Forum discussing Database Nation. The floor is now open for your questions and comments, and please do use that aisle phone. Hi. Well, with regard to the privacy of medical records, is anything being done today on the legislative front, any proposed legislation, federal and or state, and if so, what is in the works to benefit those of us, the small segment of us that are really concerned about the privacy of their medical records. Obviously, it's more than a small segment, despite the other side. Yeah. Well, you live in Massachusetts, and it turns out that in Massachusetts, it's possible to get anybody's medical record uh, who uses health ins healthcare insurance, because the healthcare insurance uh, is reported, and those records are available. They're available with the identity stripped. And there's uh, some research work that's been done at MIT that it's very, very easy to find the identities and put them back onto the stripped medical records. Now, this matters because there actually is health care legislation that was passed a few years ago. And Congress was then supposed to pass additional legislation, and Congress didn't. So HHS is putting together some proposed legislation or proposed regulations for protecting health care records. And there's been a lot of criticism about the HHS regulate proposals because they allow for a lot of use to be made of records that have the identifier stripped. The problem is you cannot remove the identity from a set of medical records simply by removing a person's name and address. There's only so many people who were born on a certain day and who live in a certain area and have certain medical conditions. And you can, assemble, you can triangulate. I, I think that that you'll be very disappointed with, with what they come up with. In fact, there were thousands of people who registered complaints through a website that the ACLU set up. The ACLU set up a website to fax in comments on the HHS proposals, but they didn't meet the exact form that the HHS when they threw out all the faxes that they received. So I, I, um, I can't tell you that things are going to get better right now because your lawmakers don't really want them to get better. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> um, one of the facets of the no privacy argument that I've found hard to dismiss, and one of the things you brought up is, you can't really tell what he is violating the law, and actual or some proposed law that says, "Thou shalt not collect this private information." And uh, one of the the things that I find interesting about this argument is. They're saying this is a, you should have a decentralized everything monitoring system where basically if this information that you think shouldn't have been collected shows up then somebody else or some three other people come up with this information and attempt to discredit it. Yeah, and that, I'm curious to hear your reaction to this. That's Bryn's argument. He says that the real problem isn't the collection of information, but it's incorrect information in the data bank. So let's have lots of people collecting information. Well, there's a bunch of problems with that argument. The, the first one is there's never any proposal made to how to pay for all that. You know, they don't want to have video cameras simply for the rich people. All the poor people should be able to watch the rich people. It's not clear who's going to pay to deploy all those video cameras, who's going to pay to put up the video cameras in the departments, and so forth. But the problem isn't that the data is being collected. The problem is that the data is being used. And so the easiest way to deal with 
you don't the data is being collected is that if it's not hurting you then you don't have a problem but if you have large penalties and you find out then you have large penalties what we need in privacy legislation what's sorely missing right now is the idea of um, uh, mandated damages you know so that if you have a certain violation you have statutory damages that tell you how much money you get back for that it's very difficult to quantify the the attacks on privacy in, in dollars terms, which is what you need for for enforcing laws with lawsuits or with penalties. So I'll go I'll go to that no privacy argument again. One of the the other things that they say is, um, well, you know, all this data is being collected. How do you how do you stop that? And um, you could put that into environmental terms. There are all these people dumping sludge into the Charles River. How are you going to stop that? And you just, you do it. You go out and you find all the pipes. How are you going to know where the pipes are coming from? Once you start making an effort to put an end to privacy invasions, you make progress at it. Now, Jason Collette runs a, a website. He, he runs the junkbusters.com website. And he has a really interesting argument, which I'll, I'll try to put forth here. He says, let's look at what corporations do want legislation on. Corporations want legislation that protects copyright. That's like their number one thing, copyright, trademark, all forms of intellectual property. And so let's take the, the arguments that the, the anti-privacy arguments and make them anti-copyright arguments, all right? They say, well, it's impossible to stop people from copying music, so maybe you shouldn't try. Maybe just every, all information should be free, and uh, you should be able to download things from the internet and email it to your friends, and it'll just be a better society. There are a lot of people who, who like that idea. I like that idea. I'm a consumer. I don't want to pay for music, but but corporations are saying no matter how hard it is to lock up intellectual property in the age of computers, we're going to do We're going to pass the Digital Millennium Act. We're going to booby trap every single um, MP3 player so that they, the music can't come out of the machine after it goes into the machine. We're going to deploy DVDs that are encrypted so you can't decrypt them. And when somebody breaks the decryption technique, we're going to put them in jail for doing that. And we're going to have massive efforts to find people who are violating copyright and put them in jail too. Now, if we were proposing to do that with privacy, corporations would be saying, no, you know, it's just not going to work. It's too hard to find everybody violating privacy. But they're going to do that, or they're going to try to do that for people violating copyright. And so when it's their interests at stake, it's it's very possible to, to do this with legislation and technology. But when it's our interest at stake, you know, give up, just have, live in a no privacy world. But I'm not going to accept that. I, I think that, that that's a fallacious argument. Yes. I wonder if concern with privacy is unique to the United States or is it universal? Well, actually, lack of concern is, is the real thing here. If you go to Europe, um, you tell them about things that happen here, they go, Wow, that's not legal here. People just don't do that here. Um, much more concern in Europe and Australia. In Australia, they, they came in with a national ID card. And there were riots. There were 100,000 people marching against the national ID card. Now, is that more than we would have here? I mean, is it more than a Social Security card? Well, I think we have a national ID card. We, we call it a driver's license. OK, so, so <laughs> the, what they were doing was instituting something that we already have, and there was opposition to it. Is that what you're saying? I, I'm saying that. that was it a requirement to carry that ID card? Yeah. Well, you don't, you're not required to carry a driver's license. Oh, well, it's, actually. It's very useful, but it's not a requirement. There, there are cases where you are required to carry it. But the, I, I would say that in general, Americans feel less concerned about privacy issues where it has to deal with companies and more concerned where it has to deal with government. And Europeans, Canadians, Australians, feel more concerned with being protected from businesses and less concerned with being protected from their government. And the problem that I see moving forward is we're afraid of the government, but it's the government that we're going to have to use in order to put controls on businesses. There are many more people who work in business than who work in the government, and they got more money 
and they got more advanced technology. You know, my company, Sandstorm Enterprises, sells things to the government, and we sell things to business. And business has got a lot more talent and a lot more money, and they're engaged in a lot more privacy-invasive things right now. The only thing they, the government can do is the government can put you in jail. And that, that's a problem. But a lot of people I know who've been through identity theft feel that their lives have been really disrupted, ju just as much. But if I understand this correctly, you're saying that in Europe, for example, people trust the government to protect them from business more than here. Here, they would have to trust the government from business, which you think is the biggest threat, but they don't trust the government to protect them from business. Isn't this, I'm wondering whether the Europeans, I don't know, I'm just wondering whether they have a solution which we will have to adopt. The, well, they want us to adopt it. Europe, uh, in nine, a few years ago, passed the European Union Data Directive, which said that personal information in Europe could not be transmitted to lawless privacy regions like the United States. <laughs> you know, where, where people's human, fundamental human rights are not respected. And um, they keep putting back the deadline. The deadline was supposed to be October 98. And I was waiting for the guy to come out with big scissors and cut the fiber optics going over the Atlantic Ocean, but he never came. Uh, Europe wants the United States to enact some sorts of privacy protection laws, just at least for European citizens when their data comes to the United States. And our government has put forth some safe harbor provisions, which you can argue about whether they, they do a job protecting it or not. I think that you know, my vision of the future is that we're going to have some sorts of, of fundamental privacy protections in law. It's unreasonable to think that we won't. But it doesn't have to be next year. Now, I can talk about the inevitability of legislation, but it, I like looking at historical parallels. And one of the historical parallels that I've had to deal with a lot personally is lead paint. Back in 1910, 1915, it was clear there was scientific evidence at the time that lead paint caused neurological damage in children. This was known. And actually, one place, I think it was Baltimore, Maryland, passed legislation banning the use of lead paint. But the pigment industry was very influential and managed to block further scientific research and the passage of legislation that would have banned lead paint. And they got that for 50 years or 60 years. It wasn't until the 1970s when lead paint was banned in the United States. Now we live in a society in which lead paint is one of the greatest threats to young children. And two houses that I've lived in have had tremendous lead paint problems. And the United States is facing a cleanup effort of more than $100 billion because an industry was very effective in preventing legislation from being passed. It was inevitable, but it took 60 years. The same thing's happening with privacy. We are seeing threat after threat, snafu, uh, gaffes. We're seeing like the DoubleClick incident. DoubleClick was going to take all of its web profiles and take all of its mailing list profiles and knit them together to really know who everybody was on the internet. And there was this huge outcry. And DoubleClick said, oh, we're sorry. We're not going to do this until people aren't upset that we're doing this. <laughs> they didn't say we're never going to do this. They said we're going to wait until it's a more political, politically favorable climate. We've had uh, a story that I broke back in 1997 was that the U.S. Um, the uh, Social Security Administration set up a website where you could go to the website, type in your Social Security number, your mother's maiden name, your date of birth, and see your entire um, Social Security benefits, but also see how much money you'd made every year for your entire life. And the problem is you could see anybody's form you wanted to. And uh, I went to the Social Security Administration and I said, nobody's going to like this. And they said, well, we've done test marketing and nobody's really offended by this. And I said, this is a tremendous problem. And they said, yeah, right. And I published it on the front page of USA Today. And three days later, the website was shut down and there was congressional inquiries. But it shouldn't be up to journalists to protect the privacy of US citizens. That's the system that we have right now, which is, you know, basically it's privacy protection by articles. And that's, there's a lot that we miss. I'd like to go back to, I think, the previous question. You were talking about the no privacy scenario. 
do we not sometimes he is there not an argument that's almost the the inverse of the copyright issues you were bringing up and that is the you know the ownership of your identity and the the ownership of your information the ownership of your thoughts uh, is this not also sometimes proposed as the solution for the future of privacy yeah that that's really good <clears throat> thoughts um I have a, actually a whole section about brain wiretapping in my book, but um, let's let's not go there right now. Oh, water, cool. Um, yeah, I, I actually have a chapter in the book called "Who Owns Your Information," in which I, I look at that question in particular. Should we use ownership as the tool for protecting privacy? And the answer is no. Don't do that. Um, <laughs> you don't want to do that because things that you own, you can sell you can give away. And if, you, if I give you, like, my pen, then it's yours. And you can do with it what you want. And we see a lot of cases in which corporations are very good at making citizens agree to contracts that citizens don't even read. It's, it's very easy to imagine ways where if you made privacy a uh, property right, that property right could be given away. And already we've seen it. Um, there's a lot of cases of ownership of genetic information. And there's actually court cases now, a California Supreme Court case, that you don't own your genetic fi fingerprint. You don't own the, the list, you know, the gene expressions. If a company pays the money to analyze your genome, they own it. You don't. Because in you, it's in the wild, you know. You're the jungle. But if they do it, they've actually done the work to recover that information. So, in the past, in, in cases where ownership has been used to protect privacy, it's been used to protect the privacy of businesses. They have more lawyers than we do, and they can work the system better than we can. There, there are other cases in which you clearly don't want to use ownership to protect privacy. It's when people think about using ownership, they say, well, I own my personal information. But they're not really thinking of it in terms of like an, a property right that they can transfer. They're actually thinking of it more as an inalienable right. They're thinking of it as what the French call moral rights, rights of creators. And that, that's not a property right. That's a, that's a human right. And in fact, the United Nations Charter, the United Nations Declaration on Human Rights, says that privacy is a fundamental human right to which we are all entitled. U.S. business hasn't heard the message. Well, the U.S. Supreme Court at one point was, was saying that the right privacy was also a right that American citizens had under the Constitution. And you've talked a lot about lawsuits to recover lost, stolen identities, um, to recover damages. Are the courts going to force legislation on us, or are the courts a slow and tortuous route toward protection of privacy? Well, well, we, we actually don't live in a world where courts can force legislation, but the, the courts can, the courts are finding a privacy right. The, the privacy right was found by, in the Griswold decision, and it's been uphold, upheld by both, by both conservative and liberal courts. The problem that the courts have is that it's very difficult for me to say, you know, I registered at a website, and they sold my name to a spammer. And I'm getting five email messages a day now that I didn't want. Like, you go to court, and they say, well, what's the damage? You know, like, well, I bill at $300 an hour. So that's $5 a minute. And it takes me about 20 seconds to delete each of those email messages. So that's like a minute and a half. That's 7 bucks. So my damage is like 7 bucks a day. And over the course of a year, that's like $2,100. It's very difficult to get an attorney to take a, a case for $2,100. You need statutory damages. And the, the courts can't create statutory damages. They can't say, well, we think that there should be a $5 per email message damage or $50 per email message damage. That's, that's the job of legislators. And there's, there's just a whole bunch of uncertainty. Like, uh, you do public policy in the courts. It's a bit, you need, you got to hope you have smart judges. I'd rather do public policy in the forums where we do public policy, because at least it's out in the open. 
But that, that's also the reason why I want to see the creation of a regulatory industry, uh, organization. Because on the whole, the, you know, it's like I, I point to HHS, but on the whole, like EPA is better at doing environmental regulations than Congress is. Because Congress is more susceptible to backroom shenanigans and there's, there's really no appeal process for when they pass bad law. But we do have this whole body of, regulatory, of administrative procedures and administrative law for dealing with stuff that is, is arbitrary or unfair, capricious. I think that it's the job of Congress to decide what the rights will be, but then we should have a regulatory body to write the detailed legislation. Congress shouldn't be legislating on cookies. You know? Yes, come to the microphone, please. Since we'll give you a second question. You seem no to be advocating one. litigious solutions as opposed to, my impression would be in Europe, the government would deal with the problem without any litigation. You, you want each individual to hire his own lawyer and have a big lawsuit, which is one of the problems in this country with everything from auto uh, accidents to environmental cases. The government doesn't. I'm not saying it's a better, well, it does seem to be a much more efficient solution, the way the Europeans would do it, I think. Uh, aren't you just going to create a jobs program for lawyers <clears throat> instead of having the government deal with the issue and punish people who violate uh, whatever law they establish? Now, we have a problem with the First Amendment. I know we can't regulate certain things like the Internet. Germany does, though, I believe. They have the authority to exclude certain operations on the Internet. Uh, don't we have a different, well, I just wondered, isn't there a better way to do it than what you seem to be advocating with a lot more work for lawyers? Well, well let, me, let me see where to start on that one. Um, but I've actually never been accused of wanting to create a lot of jobs for lawyers. I, I'm not sure that, that lawsuits are the way to go. That's why I want to see the creation of a regulatory structure. You see, right now we're in the situation where the only way for people to enforce their privacy rights is to file suit because there is no, um, there is no bureaucracy, there are no regulators, there are no individuals in government charged with looking out for us. The, the U.S. Congress in 1991 passed the Telephone Consumer Privacy Act, or Consumer Telephone Privacy Act, which is supposed to prohibit people from calling you up. But they didn't create an enforcement mechanism aside from people filing suit against telemarketers. So I, I think that you misunderstand my position. I don't like the idea of dealing with violations of privacy by lawsuit. I think it's a very inefficient way. And I think that it creates a uncertainty for businesses. Because before you go to court, you have no idea what's legal and what's not legal. That creates a uncertainty that makes people not really know what's going on. Unfortunately, that's the world we live in right now. World, you mean the country. Not well, just, the world isn't that way, it's just the United States. That's the country we live in right now. Now, the, the other thing you, you commented on is that there are First Amendment issues. And there are tremendous First Amendment issues that affect the United States when we look at privacy regulations. But we have been able to negotiate, we have been able to create very good legislation that balances the is interests of the First Amendment with commercial interests, with other interests. Um, there's not an unrestricted right to free speech in this country. If there was, there'd be no copyright law. I would be able to take somebody else's book and photocopy it and say, this is my right to free speech, and you cannot do that. The government can regulate the Internet, and we've seen that there's a lot of regulation on such issues as copyright, gambling, pornography. There's regulations on issues such as uh, trademarks, who can... Uh, carry internet traffic, what obligations being on the internet creates. I don't see that privacy is something so fundamentally different from some of the other issues that we are dealing with successfully 
that uh, it makes it off limits. The uh, appeal to Europe is a dangerous thing in the American political context because so many Americans feel that Europe was what we were trying to get away from, that we don't want to go back there. We don't want to have income taxes over 50%. We don't want to have a repressive legislative regime in which businesses are always breaking the law and they just hope that they don't get caught. We would be in a situation where you have to ask permission before you do something. That's anti-American. And I agree with that. I don't want to live in Europe. But on the other hand, there are some ideas. You know, the idea of data protection was originally a US idea. And we dropped the ball. So I, I think that there is a way looking at the European experience and looking at data protection ideas that are American in genesis, that we can come up with a system that will respect the First Amendment and respect our free enterprise and yet create rights for Americans. Just as we've done that for food, just as we've done that for drugs, just as we've done that for the environment. Legislation um, on the internet always causes me to smirk, given that geography is purely irrelevant. Um, uh, business could always house their server in a country that has really poor privacy legislation. Um, so it seems to me that having US specific legislation won't fully address the problem. Um, how are you addressing some of those concerns? Well. <coughs> It's, it's a good question. The, um, you know, it's true that you can go anywhere you want on the internet, but for some reason, most of the spam mail I get is from US companies. <laughs> and even when it comes from Japan or Korea or like Finland, it's always pushing US products. So I think you can go anywhere you want on the internet, but fundamentally, if they're attacking US citizens, they're probably doing it because they have some sort of US commercial interest. Um, the fact that they vector through a server located in an area with poor privacy protection fundamentally doesn't matter. It may make it harder to do the investigation. But if they're coming after US citizens, that there's a reason they're coming after US citizens. Now, with that said, I don't think that the internet as we know it today is going to be around in 20 years. We have an unrestricted internet. And I believe that the, in well, the internet today looks a lot like US borders did in the 1820s, 1840s. Back then, anybody could come into the United States. And I think that we're going to be seeing something I call electronic border control. Now, the people who are internet netizens don't like that idea. But I, I do see that as the future. I don't think it's go we're going to be in a future where people in essentially lawless countries will be given unrestricted access to American information servers. Uh, your comment about uh, the internet changing and the face of the internet changing um, made me think about the rise in um, wearable computers and that being a, a direction which a lot of research is, is being uh, funded and um, there seems to be uh, tremendous potential for privacy abuse with um, certain devices that you would wear that monitors your biological functions, etc. Um, I'm just curious what kinds of conversations there have been around uh, regarding privacy issues and the implications of that research on privacy? That, that's a really good question, too. The, um, there hasn't been much. I actually went to a conference on wearable computers, and there's like 30 minutes devoted to privacy issues. They, uh, they're talking about all these tremendously invasive things. But the idea is that most of the people developing wearable computers are writing the code that runs on those computers. and so. They're not worried about their own code violating their own privacy. Now, on the other hand, you know, I have this little computer here in my cell phone. And I didn't write the code that runs on the cell phone. I don't have access to the code that runs on the cell phone. And the cell phone interoperates with 
a very large infrastructure that the cellular telephone provider, in this case Sprint, has deployed. Now that infrastructure tracks the location of every phone that is turned on. It has to, because that's the only way to make calls get delivered. And when calls are, are made, the location of the calling phone and the called phone are recorded in the company's computers. Now, I spoke with a, a person at OmniPoint, another cellular telephone provider, who used to work at a cellular telephone provider in California. And he says that when the police do wiretaps, they will routinely ask for the positional information of where the person was when the call was made. That's useful for solving crimes. Now, the police do that in California. They don't do that in Massachusetts. And he said this is proof that the police in California are more technically sophisticated than the police here in Massachusetts. And they are. Now, today's system only tracks the phones that are turned on, but it doesn't record the position of every phone that's turned on. But there's no reason not to do that. In fact, there are a lot of good reasons as a network designer that I might want to record positional information for every phone. For one thing, it'll help me build out my network. For another thing, it will tell me things about my numbers that I can't get any other way. <clears throat> and then there's just tremendous marketing opportunities. I, I heard uh, at a conference, the idea is I would put my shopping list into the phone and then if I walked in front of a store that had something on my shopping list, the phone would ring and say, it's right there. Do you want to buy it? And I could press buy, walk into the store, and pick it up. Well, that, that sounds great, right? I don't want to live in that world. But I cannot live in that world simply by not putting my shopping list into the phone. Now, that world is coming. The, the FCC has mandated that cellular telephones, which now you can track to within, say, 500 meters to 5,000 meters, that they'd be trackable to 50 meters. And that's for 911. They want it so if I dial 911 on this phone right now, it goes to the Massachusetts State Police. Well, that doesn't do me any good here. I'd want it to go to Cambridge Police. I'd want to know that I was right here. I might want that for, like, medical reasons. Um, so we're, we're going to see very, very high resolution positional information on telephones. And without legislation on what can be done with that information, you're going to see a range of, of services deployed that use that information, some to your advantage and some not to your advantage. So you don't even have to talk about wearable computers. I don't have a specific question, but I... Although I agree with what you're saying about the dangers from business, I'm a little concerned that you seem relatively unconcerned, or at least what I've, from what I've heard so far, about the dangers to privacy from government. I mean, we live in a time where government's relatively quiet or benign, but if you think to the, the Red Scare of the 1920s, the Red Scare of the 1950s, the FBI investigations of anti-Vietnam people in the 60s and 70s, it seems to me that the government is a pretty potent danger to privacy, particularly for people who have dissident views or, um, or perhaps group members of groups that are un disfavored or whatever. I wonder if you could say a little bit more about those kinds of threats and what your thoughts are about how to protect against it, because your, your basic model is we want to have the government regulate these things and protect us, but what if the government is part of the threat? What's the question? <clears throat> you should read my book, because <laughs> I actually have this whole chapter called Kooks and Terrorists about how bad the government is, and the justification of why the justification of catching terrorists is no justification. But I don't look at the government as like some big monolithic organization. Uh, what I want is I want the creation of a privacy commission. And that would be a watchdog on the federal government and on state governments, just as much as it would be a watchdog on private business. right? Now, the largest polluter in the United States is the environmental, sorry, the largest polluter in the United States is the federal government, right? And in particular, the U.S. Army. And the, the organization that has done the most to find that out is the U.S. government, in particular, the Environmental Protection Agency. 
So the only way we actually have in this country for controlling what the government does is through the government and legislation. Now, I'm very concerned about uh, the possibility of a future totalitarian business, uh, government in this country. If you go and talk to the FBI, they're not concerned about that at all. <laughs> in fact, if you talk to the FBI, they'll tell you that they're our best protection against totalitarianism. <laughs> and they, they say that it's unrealistic to put systematic protections in the technology so that it's impossible for the government to exercise totalitarian control. I believe that we need to build systems that are secure against attack, both from business and by the government. But the best way to do that is to build it in with technology. So I do see regulation and technology going hand in hand. Now, now the last thing I'll, I'll, I'll say on, on this front is that um, it's, if you're really worried about, you know, I, I, to write the book, I, I looked into a lot of things that I was actually much more interested in sort of the uh, anti-German stuff happening around World War I. And there were groups like the Terrible Tattlers. There was basically a you know, whole infrastructure, the Junior Spies of America. It, instead of the Boy Scouts of America, we had the Junior Spies of America. And their job was to find people who were um, you know, or saboteurs. And of course, they just found unpopular people and had them lynched, right? And it was really it was bad. But fundamentally, if, if you live in a society in which there is mass hysteria, and where 80% of the people in the society decide to get the other 20%, all the, the structures that you put together, the policy structures, they're only going to hold out so long. You're going to replace the people on the Supreme Court. You're going to replace the lawmakers. Fundamentally, the reason we live in a democratic, the democratic society works because we don't have 80% out to get 20%. We have 49% out to get 51%, something like that. <laughs> but so I, I, I really believe in democracy. And because I believe in democracy, I want to see the creation of a watchdog agency to watch over the government. And business. I'd be interested to know what you think of the census. Um, there, <laughs> oh no, um, because there's you know been a lot of talk, um, especially about George W. Bush's comments that the census is too invasive, and why does the government need to know all this information about me? And I'd also like to know if you have any information about what the privacy policies are for the census. Once they get all that information, who can have it? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, well, first of all, as far as George W. Bush goes, uh, <laughs> the, um, the Privacy Journal last, last month, it rated every state's privacy pol protection program state by state basis, who were the good states, who were the bad states. And I'm happy to say California and Massachusetts were both in the top tier. And off the scale, they said off the scale was Texas. <laughs> it's at the bottom of, in terms of protecting personal privacy. But it's true that Bush is tapping into a very serious concern on the part of Americans that, that the census is asking a lot of questions. Now, I look at the census in my book, actually in the second chapter of my book, in the history of the census. And actually, you know, computers were developed for the US Census. The very first computers were developed to track people and to help the US Census count all the cards. That's Herman Hollerith, the inventor of the punch card, worked at the Census Bureau. Now, the, the whole mission creep at the US Census is because the Congress of the United States has, <laughs> over time, asked the Census to collect more and more information. And the census is a reflection of our inquisitiveness as a society of wanting to understand ourselves. So that, that's, that's really interesting. Why does the census ask all these questions about race? Well, because as a people, we want to know the racial makeup of the people living here. You know, we are a society obsessed by race, and the census reflects that. We're a society obsessed by indoor plumbing and television, and the long form of the census reflects that too. 
The, uh, I was actually really disappointed that I didn't get the long form. I wanted to fill out all the questions. Now, the, um, the question is, well, can we trust them? No, we can't trust the census. It doesn't matter. You're legally required to fill out the form. Um, you could burn it. You could have a, a census burning. I mean, it'd be illegal. It'd be like draft card burning, right? And, and it might go over really well. The, uh, the problem is there's this weird liberal angst over the census, because on the one hand, they want to have lots of minorities register so that they get, you know, with the census so that they get more representation and more money going to minority communities. But at the same time, you know, those are the constituencies that are usually worried about privacy issues. So there's been sort of this grid, liberal grip going on as far as the census is concerned. The census has a really bad history of protecting this information. They, you know, in World War II, census information was used to round up Japanese Americans and send them to concentration camps. And even in the last census, the 1990 census, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal that on Long Island, the, the Census Bureau released block level information. Well, the blocks on Long Island are really small. And the information that they released, the number of people living on each block, that was used to by by policymakers, by, by zoning officials on Long Island to find houses that had been illegally converted to two families. Um, so basically, they, they destroyed a whole bunch of affordable housing that existed illegally on Long Island with the help from the census. Right. So uh, what do I think we should do? Well, I think we should have a US Privacy Commission, because a US Privacy Commission <laughs> could watch the census and make sure that they were doing the right thing. The, the census has no organization that's checking them. We have to trust them. There's like. I guess GAO can double check the census, or you know, the Congress can double check the census. But there is no trust, uh, there's no brain trust in the federal government that like, lives and breathes privacy issues. And because of that, everybody's just sort of winging it on their own. You know, I, I don't like that. I, well, I'm torn. I'd like to ask you some more very specific questions. I'm um, particularly interested in these, this technology that can read brain, brains and determine what my thoughts are. Maybe, maybe I could use one when I'm old and senile and it can tell me what I'm thinking. But I'd like to, to close by asking you a bigger question. It seems like this the challenge of solving the, the problem of privacy, it, sometimes we want privacy Sometimes we don't. Sometimes privacy benefits us. Sometimes it is not a burden, but it, it, in, it prevents us from participating in society. It prevents us from, from you know, a com a, some kind of communal ethical life. How do you see a way of balancing those two directions given America's history of bootstrap individualism? Hmm. Well, the, the glib answer is I think we should have a Federal Privacy Commission, but, but I want that's, to get beyond that's not the that right answer. answer. Um, you know, I, I, I think that we largely have a tradition of personal choice. and. If we start off with an assumption of data protection, if we start off with an assumption that privacy is an inalienable human right, then it's individuals' choice what they want to reveal about themselves. It's like, I've made a decision to put my wedding photographs on my website. It was a public event. It, it remains one. Uh, I've made a decision not to put you know, my, my daughter's sonograms on my website. I actually wanted to have this whole section about fetal privacy in the book, but it, it didn't work out. It's just too advanced a concept. Um, so I, I think that if you start with a position that we have this fundamental human right, then, you know, people can decide what they want to do with that right. But that's not really the position that we have right now in U.S. law. And that's what needs to be corrected. So you, you see 
a need to protect the individual's right to privacy. And you, do you see that by protecting that right to privacy, we foster a democratic community, a democratic society? Oh, absolutely. I, I argue in the book that you cannot have democracy without privacy rights. And that when you destroy privacy rights, you destroy democracy. And that's why I see violence, ultimately, with no privacy. I see people conducting acts of data terrorism. Already it's happening. You know, uh, there, One could argue that a lot of the hackers on the internet were motivated by you know, the, the machine, but, but attacks on privacy, attacks of, you know, attack, that's why they're attacking businesses. And um, I see a lot of informational violence if we don't have support for privacy rights. So Robert Frost was right. Good <coughs> fences make good neighbors? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I, I also think that even if we were to lose all privacy today, if everything about us was known, we could just draw a line in the sand and you know start having a new privacy regime after that and one year later there'd be like a whole year of private information things that had happened two years later you'd have two years of privacy so i don't think it's ever too late um i don't buy the argument well the, the horse is out of the barn it's too late get used to it no but uh you know, the sooner we do it the cheaper it's going to be thank you simpson garfinkel Simpson Garfinkel writes for the Boston Globe. He's the author of nine books, including Web Security and Commerce, Architects of the Information Society, and PGP, Pretty Privacy. Database Nation is published by O'Reilly and Associates. Forty-eight hours of nonfiction books.